They took the world to war. Now they see their re-election for a second term, not only as an endorsement of the occupation of Iraq, but also of their personal vision of the future. A 21st century dominated by the U.S. I wish I could tell you it was about oil. I wish I could tell you it was about Israel. No, this is about an idea. It is the very heart of American foreign policy. But incredibly, it's been largely driven not by the instincts of President George W. Bush, but of his running mate, the man some say is second in command, in name only. It's just impossible to overestimate Cheney's importance. Dick Cheney's world is a place where he controls the inner sanctum, doing and saying what he wants about American power. The government of the United States will not look the other way as threats accumulate against us. About business. We've not done any business in Iraq since the sanctions were imposed. About war. Time is not on our side that if we wait, uh, he will continue to develop ever more deadly capabilities. But in Dick Cheney's world, what he says is frequently more fiction than fact. Before 9-11, we tended to think... And what he does often seems to be motivated less by principle than power, self-interest, and money. And as we'll show you, his story tells a great deal about the world in which we live and how it got that way. Dick Cheney started out in Casper, Wyoming an oil industry outpost where he grew up to be a high school football star. And Cheney had talent. Football captain. Top 10 student. Boyfriend of homecoming queen Lynn Vincent. According to Cheney, some of his earliest memories were of vehicles in the nearby oil fields. He didn't know it yet, but those distinctive red trucks belonged to a company that would play a big part in his life, Halliburton. What Cheney did know was that there was life beyond Casper. A family friend pulled some strings, and he got a scholarship to Yale. It's hard to flunk it out of Yale. It's um, something that one really has to put an effort into. Yale, at that time, um, tried to make sure that everybody who entered graduated. Jacob Plotkin was Cheney's Yale roommate. He recalls a homesick young man who preferred typing letters to his girlfriend to attending class. Where others might spend some time on a weekend studying, Dick was either talking, drinking, playing cards with his football buddies. In the end, Cheney flunked out of Yale twice as I often remind George Cheney. W. Bush, who squeaked through Yale himself with a C average, went out of his way to rub it in. So now we know. If you graduate from Yale, you become president. If you drop out, you get to be vice president. <laughs> Back in Wyoming, there were other things on Cheney's mind. He took a job with a local power company. He got arrested for drunk driving. Even worse, he had lost his student draft deferment just as the U.S. was becoming embroiled in Vietnam. The man who would eventually send Americans off to war wasn't enthusiastic about going to war himself. In 1963, with thousands of GIs already in Southeast Asia, Cheney went back to college and got another student deferment. In 1964, when Congress approved unlimited force in Vietnam, that student deferment was renewed, and he wed his high school sweetheart, Lynn. In 1965, when President Lyndon Johnson doubled the number of draftees, Cheney graduated. He should have been prime draft bait, but he wasn't, because he was now a married man. When the U.S. announced it would start drafting married men without children, Call it good luck or good timing, but nine months and two days later, the Cheney's first child was born. Cheney was rewarded with a fifth and final exemption from military service. At last, on his 26th birthday, he could relax. He was officially too old to be drafted. Now, instead of avoiding the U.S. government, he set out to join it. <laughs> 
When Dick Cheney first arrived here in Washington from Wyoming, he went to work for a Republican congressman. Ironically, the first project for the man who'd engineered a series of draft deferments to keep himself out of Vietnam was writing a law to punish colleges for allowing anti-war protests. And Dick Cheney's career had only just begun. They were heady days for Republicans when Richard Nixon took back the presidency after eight years of Democratic rule. And Cheney was determined to take advantage. He met with one of the young Turks of the new administration, Donald Rumsfeld, and he talked his way into a job. Eventually, the two of them would move to the White House together, Rumsfeld as Gerald Ford's chief of staff, Cheney as his deputy. I found memos from Cheney about what salt shakers should be used at White House dinners, uh, whether Betty Ford should have a headrest on the helicopter or not, uh, who, who gets White House Christmas cards and who doesn't. Journalist James Mann has covered Dick Cheney's journey through the corridors of power for more than 30 years. Cheney is a guy who started at the bottom. He knows uh, how the White House works right down at the grassroots level, and then he uses that to great effect. Cheney's quiet rise continued nonstop. Youngest White House chief of staff, congressman for a decade, then secretary of defense under the first President George Bush, and here's where the story of Dick Cheney really starts to get interesting. Tonight, the first pictures of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. It was almost a decade and a half ago when Iraqi troops took control of Kuwait. But what happened next is today eerily familiar. Then, as recently, men named Bush and Cheney denounced Saddam Hussein as a threat to the world and claimed they had proof. Top secret satellite photos from Cheney's Pentagon showing a quarter of a million Iraqi troops and 1,500 tanks massed along the border with Saudi Arabia, poised to invade. There was no reason to believe that the administration wasn't being candid about what was there. Uh, but we had a chance to find out, to test the theory, and we took it. Back in 1991, reporter Jean Heller was based in Washington. Through a stroke of luck, she learned about another set of high-altitude photos of Kuwait taken by a Soviet satellite on the very same day the Pentagon said there showed a quarter of a million Iraqi troops and 1,500 tanks preparing to invade Saudi Arabia. And what did that second set of images reveal? It's what it didn't show that was more important. Uh, what you would have expected to have seen were tanks on the border. There were none. That, we could, that, that could be seen. There was nothing behind the border that could have supported that kind of number of troops and tanks. We've obtained copies of those Soviet satellite photos from September 1990. With powerful magnification, the photographs are detailed enough for experts to identify vehicles around the Kuwaiti oil fields. But in southern Kuwait, along the Saudi border, there are no Iraqi tanks to be seen whatsoever let alone 1,500 of them, just sand and wind. Not a sign of what Defense Secretary Cheney insisted were a quarter of a million Iraqi troops. It became a critical issue because it was, the administration convinced the Saudis they were at imminent, they were in imminent danger and got the Saudis to invite the coalition to come in and defend them. And that's how we got involved in Gulf War I. Coincidentally, Jean Heller is also from Wyoming. As a journalist there, she had dealt with Dick Cheney for years. So she presented her evidence directly to his office at the Pentagon. I said, look, if you can prove to me that our story isn't true, we won't run it. And they just ignored us. When Kuwait was liberated, the issue disappeared. As for Cheney's top secret satellite images. They have never showed those photos. Not then and not since. Not to this day. More than a decade later, men named Cheney and Bush would again lead a rush to attack Saddam Hussein, predicting impending doom with little to prove it. And as you'll see when we come back, between his wars with Iraq, Dick Cheney would make himself a very rich man.
doing business not only with the U.S. government, but also with its enemies. He says that he wasn't aware that Halliburton was doing business with Iraq while he was the CEO there. If you believe that, then he's either a very, very bad CEO for not being aware of something like that, or he's not telling the truth. It was 1991. The first Gulf War was over, and communism was collapsing. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney set out to downsize the U.S. military. He hired a private company to help him do it. They came up with a plan and a recommendation for who best could implement it themselves. Theirs is now a household name, Halliburton. That connection would start paying off three years later when Bill Clinton took over the White House and Dick Cheney found himself out of a job. With time on his hands, he and some business friends came to the Miramichi River in New Brunswick to catch salmon. The story goes that Cheney was taking a nap when talk turned to a company looking for a new chief executive. It was a big name in the oil services business and at the Pentagon, Halliburton. The consensus? Why not Dick? Since he wasn't there to object, uh, sure enough, you know, a few weeks later, he was named the CEO and chairman of uh, Halliburton. Business reporter Dan Briotti is the author of a recent history of Halliburton. He says the choice of Cheney, a consummate government insider, was no accident. If you're in Halliburton's position, you have a history, an 80-year history, of using politicians or ex-politicians um, to do your bidding for you in Washington, D.C. Halliburton's role model was former President Lyndon Johnson. He had helped Halliburton get work in Washington. They had helped him to the White House. Dick Cheney is just is simply the latest in a succession of politicians that Halliburton has used to score government contracts. When Cheney took over Halliburton, a Canadian named Abdulmir Mahdi was in the oil business too. Born in Iraq, he'd come to Canada in his 20s and was the father of four. He had built a successful business supplying oil fields in Iran with North American parts, often purchased from Halliburton. You'd done business with them before. You were registered in their system. You had a customer number. They knew the market what, we serve. They knew what you wanted and where it went. That's exactly yes. But the U.S. was getting tougher with states sponsoring terrorism, like Iran, Iraq, and Libya, and clamping down on Americans doing business with them. When the U.S. passed that embargo prohibiting trade with Iran in the mid-90s, Abdullah Mermadi says he sought legal advice as to how it might affect a Canadian. He says he went to Canada Customs and to a Toronto law firm, and that he was told, you're not American, you're based in Canada. The ban doesn't apply to you. Mahdi didn't know it yet, but south of the border, American law enforcement had other ideas. He wasn't American, he wasn't in the U.S., but that didn't discourage the U.S. federal agents who were keeping an eye on him. Subsequently, we determined that most of the equipment, the orders that actually went, were going to Iran. Lyndon Berezowski was the U.S. Export Enforcement Agent who supervised the case against Mahdi. Once the law, once these acts became illegal, and he knew it was illegal to do it, he then continued to do it. And but I it wasn't illegal for him to do it in Canada, which is where he was doing it. No, but it was illegal for him to violate U.S. law, and what he was charged with was violating U.S. law. Illegal or not, American agents lured Mahdi onto U.S. soil by convincing a supplier to invite him to a meeting in Florida. When did you realize that you were in big trouble? When they handcuffed me in Florida. Mahdi was arrested. He pled guilty to evading U.S. export controls and spent almost four years in prison. The question he asks now is, if he was guilty of breaking the law, why was it Halliburton, the company whose parts he had sold to Iran for years? Would it not stand to reason that after the embargo got put in place, when you came to them looking for parts, that's where those parts would go? Would they not know that? Uh, well, it doesn't take a bright man to figure this out, you know. We only sell Halliburton to Iran. We never sold Halliburton to anybody but Iran. 
So you'd think investigators would have tried to establish exactly what Halliburton's role was. Specifically, if Dick Cheney's company knew its parts were going to Iran. Not according to Mahdi. In all of this, did anyone ever mention Halliburton? Never. Can you understand how someone would look at this and say, you know what, they're going after the little guy and ignoring the big multinational corporation with the political connections at the very top that stands to benefit the most here? Uh, let me assure you that had we the evidence to go after whether it was Halliburton or any other company, we certainly would. But there was no lack of evidence that Halliburton opposed the U.S. embargo. CEO Dick Cheney went to Calgary to tell oil men it was costing them money. Sometimes government can get in the way of sound policy. An example of the ineffectiveness of government mandates are U.S. unilateral economic sanctions. To find out how Cheney and Halliburton got around that problem, you've got to come to a tax haven like the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean. Here's why the Cayman Islands are important to Halliburton. The U.S. embargo against Iran has a loophole, a big one. It is illegal for American companies and American citizens to trade with Iran. But if an American company is registered offshore and has no American employees, it can trade with anyone it wants. During Dick Cheney's time as CEO, Halliburton had dozens of those foreign subsidiaries, including one in the Cayman Islands that, interestingly enough, dealt exclusively with Iran. Halliburton's address in the Caymans is at this bank, but there's no office here and no employees, just a mailbox. The bank manager says the company's mail gets rerouted to Houston, Texas, Halliburton's head office. This is designed to deceive, and that's what we see. Uh, it's what we've seen in Halliburton in so many ways. One of Halliburton's and Cheney's foremost critics in Washington is Democratic Senator Frank Lautenberg. He says any business with Iran is illegal, unethical, or both. We are at a virtual uh, confrontation level with Iran almost uh, at every moment. And to be looking for uh, uh, breaks in the law that permit him to prop, permit them to profit uh, while uh, this uh, hostility is in front of us is unacceptable under any condition. And it wasn't just Iran. The year Cheney took over Halliburton, the company was fined almost four million dollars for selling products that could be used as nuclear triggers to Libya. And while he was CEO, Halliburton's subsidiaries did more than 70 million dollars worth of business in Iraq at least some of which, experts agree, would have gone right into the pockets of Saddam Hussein. But when Cheney went back to Washington as vice president, those old business partners became the axis of evil. As for Abdul Amir Mahdi, sometime during his four years behind bars, he wrote Dick Cheney a letter. What did you say to Mr. Cheney? Very simple sentence. Uh, if I'm guilty, you're guilty. If you're innocent, I'm innocent. You did business with the same country I did. He's a thorough man. When we return, Mr. Cheney goes back to Washington. And America goes back to war. It was spring of the year 2000. The last U.S. presidential campaign was in full swing, and Texas Governor George W. Bush had wrapped up the Republican nomination. We get to send a signal that we're sick and tired of Clinton Gore in Washington, D.C. He needed a running mate. The Bush family asked an old friend, his father's defense secretary, Halliburton CEO Dick Cheney, to lead the search for the best man. It didn't take long for Cheney to find him. I'm proud to announce that Dick Cheney, a man of great integrity, sound judgment, and experience, is my choice to be the next Vice President of the United States. Mr. Cheney, how do you feel about being picked, sir? Pretty good. Dick Cheney's relationship with George W. Bush has been characterized in many ways as the President's mentor, his minder, as the man who's really in charge. Not me. 
What Cheney and those close to him also brought to the White House was an absolute belief that the 21st century would belong to America and that it would start with the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Saddam is ousted. Um, you get rid of the top leadership, you get a moderate Ba'athist regime, and a democracy flows out of, uh, um, a, a, like water out of a fountain. And not only will democracy flow in Iraq, it'll flow in into Syria. Syria will see the light. The Iranians will still see the light. Seymour Hirsch is one of America's foremost investigative journalists. He says even before 9-11, Dick Cheney was insistent the U.S. must invade Iraq and begin changing the world. Just go in, it's going to roll over. They believe this. They believe this. Utopian, idealist, uh, crazy. Dick Cheney's moment arrived with those jetliners on September 11th. His plan was now on the fast track. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda would know the wrath of the U.S., but so would Saddam and Iraq. I don't think it's available to us to sit back and say, please just be polite filling station attendants, pump the oil for our SUVs, uh, and leave us alone. Former CIA Director James Woolsey, now a Pentagon advisor, still supports Cheney and his argument for a preemptive attack on Saddam. A fundamental change in Iraq in which one destroyed uh, Saddam's ability to work with terrorist groups in other countries, destroyed his ability, however far along they were or were not, to have uh, programs and chemical, bacteriological, nuclear weapons. And that will have a huge effect, not just by example, uh, but a huge effect on, uh, on the Middle East as a whole. After September 11th, as after the invasion of Kuwait a decade earlier, it was Dick Cheney's job to sell a war against Iraq. We all have to recognize as a nation that 9-11 uh, that changed a great deal in our lives. We know that Saddam Hussein had the intent to arm his regime with weapons, weapons of mass destruction. We do know with absolute certainty that he is using his procurement system to acquire the equipment he needs in order to enrich uranium to build a nuclear weapon. According to Seymour Hersh, selling that nuclear threat was crucial for Cheney to convince Americans to support the war. With that case, they could not only, they could not only win the public, but they could win the Senate, the Democrats in the Senate. You, you, know, you have to understand, without that case, I don't think they could have gotten the authority. The problem was that though the Central Intelligence Agency had been tasked to find evidence of Saddam's WMDs, especially nuclear weapons, that's not what the best information showed. Dick Cheney visited CIA headquarters. Not once, the record shows, but eight separate times. He's said to have wanted to see more forward-leaning intelligence on Iraq. Analysts get the drift. They get the drift. They write reports critical, they go nowhere, they write a report that supports the White House, all of a sudden they're giving briefings at the White House, come on. Everybody gets the drift. About the same time, the Pentagon established a secretive group to work closely with the Vice President on intelligence matters. It was known as the OSP, the Office of Special Plans. Their starting point was not, let's try to figure out what was going on, but let's see what kind of information we can come up with to justify the policy line that we wish to pursue. Greg Thielman was an intelligence specialist with the State Department who watched the emergence of the OSP. It soon became clear to him what its mission was and who was behind it. Cheney was, was the driving force behind an orchestrated presentation to the American public of a different version of reality than than at least the reality that we saw. In the intelligence business, that's called cherry picking, selecting individual morsels of information that support a certain view. And stovepiping, sending them without analysis right to the White House to be inserted into the president's script. Facing clear evidence of peril, we cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun. When I heard those speeches and read the transcripts, I recognized many of the anecdotes, many of the examples from things we were being given. Former Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski was at the Pentagon, working closely with the OSP staff. 
having seen the intelligence, I knew that this was a uh, manipulation of information. It was cherry-picked information, out-of-context information, in many cases uh, information presented as confirmed when in fact it had not been ever confirmed by the intelligence community. For instance, Kwiatkowski says the OSP touted an attempt by Saddam to purchase uranium for a nuclear weapon. Without explaining, it occurred almost 15 years earlier when Iraq was a U.S. ally. It bothered me a great deal because I saw it to be manipulation. I saw it to be conscious manipulation, not an oversight, but consciously done. That's how it appeared to me. Another example, a primary source named Ahmed Shalabi, then perhaps the best-known Iraqi expatriate. His organization was paid more than $300,000 a month to provide intelligence to the Office of Special Plans. Well, come on, you, you pay somebody $345,000 know, a month, you're going to get your money's worth, right? He's, uh, he wants to keep the checks coming. He's going to keep telling you things. How are you, sir? Fine. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. How are Hello. you? Nice Chalabi, a convicted bank swindler who hadn't lived in Iraq since he was 13, hoped to become the new Iraqi president when Saddam was ousted. His OSP reports were routinely optimistic, predicting American troops would be greeted as liberators. This is what allowed uh, Iraqi National Congress, uh, Chalabi, uh, reports that have proven uh, to be completely, either completely fabricated or, or, or completely wrong, uh, to get to the President of the United States without the, the proper kind of labels. We asked ex-CIA Director James Woolsey if intelligence gathering could also be improperly influenced by Dick Cheney's unprecedented eight visits to CIA headquarters. Would you accept it is possible that the reaction to that kind of relationship with the Vice President would be what some call stove piping or cherry picking, where, you're, where you, you look for the kind of intelligence you believe they want and give it to them? Yeah, I suppose it's a, a, a possible reaction of someone, but if people reacted that way as intelligence officers, they ought to be removed and replaced by people with backbone. Uh, you don't believe that kind of thing happened in this case with Iraq? I wasn't present in any of the conversations, but whether the vice president uh, said something with a frown on his face or a smile on his face, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, it's the DCI, the CIA director's job uh, to encourage his people to call it straight, and it's their job to call it straight. But former Pentagon staffer Karen Kwiatkowski says that's not what she saw happening. If you disagree with Dick Cheney, the highly predictable result is you will no longer be working for Dick Cheney. Indeed, as 2002 became 2003 and the drums of war grew louder, the intelligence quoted by U.S. officials was unanimous. Saddam Hussein was unquestionably a nuclear threat. Within a two-week, three-week period, every senior official began to talk about mushroom clouds. <laughs> How many believed it? I, I think most of them did. When we return truth and consequences at the White House. It is essentially the betrayal of our country. It is a treasonous act. It was January 2003 when George W. Bush went to Capitol Hill to deliver the annual State of the Union address. Everyone knew what his message would be. The International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed in the 1990s that Saddam Hussein had an advanced nuclear weapons development program. This man had an intense personal interest in that speech. Weapons of mass destruction in the hands of rogue elements and non-state actors is the single greatest threat that we face to the next generation. And so you have to take it seriously. Joe Wilson is a former U.S. diplomat, an ambassador in Africa, the last American official to meet with Saddam Hussein. A year earlier, when Vice President Cheney got a tip that Saddam had been trying to buy uranium from the African nation of Niger, the CIA sent Wilson to check it out. And in essence, your conclusion was what? Well, my conclusion was it could not have taken place. Could not have taken place, did not take place. Wilson says he told the CIA the Africa rumor was false and assumed that was passed on to Cheney's office. And in fact, when I came back and gave my report, I thought, well, the vice president can sleep a little more easily tonight, knowing that there's nothing to this particular report. The State of the Union. Imad Kaduri also had a personal stake in that State of the Union address. He now lives north of Toronto, 
but for years he was one of Iraq's top nuclear scientists. America had no idea of this, the existence of this program, and neither did the Israelis, by the way. They suspected something was going on, but they couldn't get the scope of what we did. Kaduri says it was 1981 when Saddam decided to build an atomic bomb. For the next decade, they assembled the equipment, a database, and uranium. I would estimate we were about 15 to 20 percent in 1991 of where we should have been to, to declare that we had a nuclear bomb. Had we been there for three more years, plus minus a year, with that accelerated program, we would have had been able to obtain the bomb. But that never happened, according to Kaduri, because of this. The nuclear weapon program in Iraq stopped on the first night of the bombing of the Gulf War, 1991. That night, coalition aircraft flew more than a thousand bombing runs in Iraq. When they were finished, Saddam's nuclear dream was too. That's because they actually bombed the nuclear research center at the site where we did our research. control, the, the manufacturing, the processing. That was bombed. Therefore, the whole program stopped. He insists that nuclear program was never rebuilt. Saddam Hussein has gone Years later, from his new home in Canada, he watched the U.S. mount its case to attack Iraq again. Weapons of mass destruction. On the night that I heard President Bush enunciating his clear intention of invading Iraq on the pretext of nuclear weapon program, I was, I was struck by the incredulity of that charge. Which brings us back to Joe Wilson. Remember, he's the former U.S. ambassador sent to Africa to investigate the tip to Dick Cheney that Saddam Hussein had tried to buy uranium for nuclear weapons. Wilson thought he'd debunked that rumor. Then, in the State of the Union address, he heard these 16 words. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. It was a crucial moment. Now there could be little doubt. Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, and he wanted a nuclear bomb. When you hear the president in that State of the Union address, what possible explanation? Well, then it became clear to me that there had been a deliberate attempt on the part of some members of the government to deceive the U.S. Congress and deceive the American people, and indeed, uh, given the fact that the State of the Union address is broadcast around the world, uh, deceive the world as to the nature of the threat posed by Saddam's nuclear programs. Wilson says he tried to convince the administration to retract the statement, then decided to go public himself with this op-ed article in the New York Times. The White House wasn't pleased. They had a political agenda uh, that included uh, maintaining support for this war, and uh, they did not want that support to erode by a number of people coming out uh, and saying, uh, you were flat wrong or you lied about this or you deceived the American people about this. The White House still maintains there is evidence to suggest Saddam Hussein tried to buy African uranium. But according to Joe Wilson, that's no longer the issue. He says what's important now is what happened after he told Dick Cheney something the vice president didn't want to hear. Joe Wilson didn't know it at the time, but he says that after he began to speak out, a meeting was convened at the White House in the office of the vice president. The subject was him. This is a bunch of White House political hacks deciding if they're going to run an intelligence operation, find out everything they can about Joe Wilson. And during the course of running that operation, they apparently um, uh, unearthed uh, my wife's name and her profession. The next week, Washington Post columnist Bob Novak revealed that profession in print. It's no small point, because Wilson's wife, Valerie, is a CIA agent. How beyond the pale is it for someone in the administration to reveal to a journalist like Bob Novak the identity of an undercover CIA. It's a agent. betrayal of national security. It is essentially the betrayal of our country. It is a treasonous act. Uh, it may never be prosecuted as such, but it is an act of betrayal of the country. 
Novak will only say he got the information from two senior administration officials. Joe Wilson is convinced the leak was intended as revenge against him and a message to others. And he believes it originated at that meeting in the vice president's office. The idea was to tell other analysts that if you do to us what Wilson has done to us, we'll do to you what we've just done to Wilson's wife. The manipulation of U.S. intelligence, the war that followed, and the occupation that now threatens to drag on for years have not only cost thousands of lives, they've also made Iraq a land of opportunity with billions of dollars available to the lucky few. And which American firm has benefited the most? None other than the vice president's old company, Halliburton. They've overcharged for food and lodging. They've overcharged for gasoline uh, trucking. They've overcharged for vehicles. They've overcharged for all kinds of things. Their behavior has been awful. Senator Frank Lautenberg says there are two problems. Halliburton's war profiteering and the preferential treatment that may have made it possible. It's uh, outrageous that the man sitting next to the president of the United States and exerting all the influence that Dick Cheney does. And there's no doubt about the fact that he is a very influential person in the, in, in the White House. Uh, that he still has some contact with Halliburton. Dick Cheney himself is on the record denying that. Last year he told NBC unequivocally that he had no financial interest in Halliburton of any kind. But wait a minute, that's simply not true. According to the Congressional Research Center here in Washington, Dick Cheney receives deferred compensation from Halliburton, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year of it. And he has stock options in the company worth millions of dollars more, the value of which only stands to improve the better Halliburton's business is. Cheney has also insisted he had, quote, no influence, involvement, or knowledge in any way, shape, or form in the awarding of Halliburton's government contracts. But wait another minute. A Defense Department memo recently surfaced, revealing that when Halliburton was awarded its $7 billion contract for Iraq without competition, despite his denials, the vice president's office was indeed briefed on the contract and then specifically approved it. Not surprisingly, there is a lot we would like to ask Dick Cheney. It may be even less surprising that he wasn't available to us on camera. So we asked James Woolsey, a staunch Cheney supporter who espouses many of the same ideals as the vice president, about American power, business, and war. Can you understand how people in the rest of the world listen now to the rationalizations of the war in Iraq? And given what was said before and what's happened there since, look on it as justification of what is still a bad idea. Sure. A lot of people are predisposed to think bringing democracy and the rule of law to the Middle East is a bad idea because they don't want to be, uh, have to make a contribution to it. And because, I think, they want to put their head in the sand and believe that everything will work out fine. Or, even or might think that preemptive war without consensus internationally is a bad thing? Uh, it's a traditional view. I think the president's made a good case that in a world of people like Saddam, uh, Khamenei in Iran, uh, Kim Jong-il in North Korea, that waiting for the associations with terrorists uh, and the chemical, bacteriological, nuclear weapons programs to mature is an unsound view. But Dick Cheney apparently had no trouble tolerating Iraq and Iran just a few years ago when his companies eagerly profited from them. How do you square that? No, well, Halliburton can speak for itself with respect to the circumstances in which it is. But this is a man who was the business. CEO of Halliburton and who's now the vice president of the U.S. And I guess I'm just asking, how do you see that as being something other than self-interest or even hypocrisy? Well, corporations operate according to the principle of self-interest. That's the way free economies work. And if Halliburton wasn't violating any laws in doing the kind of business in the Middle East that it did, I don't see that it's uh, particularly Well, relevant. the jury's out on that, apparently, but...
Uh, if they violated the law, they violated the law, and they ought to be punished for it. If they didn't, uh, they didn't. In Texas, a grand jury has deliberated about whether Halliburton, under Cheney, broke U.S. law by trading with states that sponsor terrorism. In Washington, the Justice Department has investigated whether the vice president's office broke the law by leaking confidential information about a CIA agent, Joe Wilson's wife. And despite the Iraqi election, a violent insurgency there continues to kill dozens of Americans each month and raise doubts about the bluster that Cheney and Bush used to sell an unwise war. But in Dick Cheney's world, it is often someone else who pays the price. And for the next few years, at least, it will still be Dick Cheney's world. The rest of us just live here.